Hello, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's RGC Discovery Webinar, Prevention Insights, Gambling Harm Prevention in Chinese, South Asian, and Indigenous Communities. My name is Melissa Tony, and I'm the Senior Manager of Community Programs here at the Responsible Gambling Council. It's hard to believe that we're already in the middle of February. Let me just start by saying, Happy Year of the Tiger to everyone that has celebrated Lunar New Year. And we hope that you all have had the opportunity to do some celebrating during Black History Month. Unfortunately, we are still virtual, but COVID-19 restrictions are slowly being relaxed. And so we do hope that we all will be able to be together in person again very soon. Before we start today's session, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today in Ontario. While we meet today on a virtual platform for this event, let's take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and our understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Today, we recognize the strength and wisdom of the land that has given rise to the people and welcomes the spirit to support this Responsible Gambling Council webinar. The Responsible Gambling Council was founded on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credits, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, the One Dot peoples. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. From coast to coast, Responsible Gambling Council shows their respect for and pays homage to the Indigenous communities which we are engaging with today. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give our respect to its first inhabitants. We are also grateful for the opportunity to work with Indigenous peoples and organizations. And now please join me for a moment of personal reflection. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to introduce my colleagues. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sasha Stark, Senior Researcher at RGC, with over 15 years experience conducting gambling focused research with Canadian and international stakeholders. Good afternoon, Sasha. Good afternoon, and next, everyone. I'd like to introduce Dr. Alex Price, who's also a senior researcher here at RGC. Alex has four years experience in the gambling field and another 10 years in public health practice, research and evaluation. Alex is joining us from British Columbia and I will now pass it on over to him for a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as we know, the, this research centers on in Ontario, um, but I'm located on the West Coast uh, where I work and, and where I live. Um, I feel it's important to acknowledge, acknowledge that. Um, I'm located specifically in Burnaby, British Columbia. These are the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Halkamalem and the Squamish-speaking peoples. And I'm glad to have the opportunity and grateful to have the opportunity to honor and acknowledge the um, history of this land. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. In addition, we are delighted to introduce to you our community partners whose insights were pivotal in making this research project possible. They will participate as our discussion panel after the presentation of the research, where we will hear from them their thoughts and perspectives on the findings. And so I'm pleased to introduce to you as part of the panel today, Baldev Mutta, founder and CEO of Punjabi Community Health Services, Vince Pipertopolo, General Manager, Family and Mental Health Services as Costi Immigrant Services. Albert Yu, President and CAO of Diversity Communications, Inc. And Jasmine Chegger, Co-Founder of Soch Mental Health. Now, in addition to our partners, there are a lot of people we know joining us here today on this call. And while we aren't able to speak speak with each of you individually, it's still important to us to know who is in this virtual space with us and to understand what has brought you here today. And so for our icebreaker exercise, we're going to use a platform called Mentimeter. 
So here's what you need to do to participate. As you can see here on the slide, please go to Mentimeter.com or scan the QR code and then enter the numerical code to participate. Once you do this, you will see two questions. Please go ahead and answer them. When you do start to input your questions, they will show on the screen. We'll then take a few moments to go through each of them to see who's in the room with us. So we'll give you a few moments to do that and then we'll call it up. Hopefully everybody is being able to access Mentimeter.com. Perhaps we can pull up the screen to see if we have any people who have already joined us. Okay. So we have Vicky Tuddy, Prevention Lead at Gamble Aware from the UK. Welcome, Vicky. Glad you're able to join us today. Richard's here to learn. Very happy to hear that, Richard. There's lots of great information. You're going to learn a lot. Josephine, and you're the new RG champion from Niagara Casinos. Welcome, Josephine. Who else do we have here with us? We have prevention in NC Youth, problem gambling prevention. Susan Sheridan Tucker, Executive Director from Minnesota. Thanks for joining us today, Susan. Glad you're here. And you're interested in hearing about uh, recent work on in these populations, right? And of course, we have our amazing leader, Shelly White, who's joining us, who is the CEO of RGC. Welcome, Shelly. Kim Steinbard, BCLC. I'm here to listen and learn. Wonderful to meet you. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Wow, we have a lot of people here today. We have people from Brampton. I think I saw someone saying they were here from Australia as well. I love technology for this reason. Richard is also here to learn. Ross Byers from PlaySmart Champion, a great blue Huron casino. We're so glad that all, you all took the time to join us today over your lunch hour, so we appreciate that. We have lots of representation from the Responsible Gambling Council. Always nice to have our colleagues come out and support us. Hi, Maria. Oh, I think the rest of your answer here was cut. Oh, nope, here it is. You're a counselor and therapist at UFT. Welcome and thanks for joining us. This is amazing. This is amazing. I think we're going to have a wonderful session this afternoon. We're happy that you all had the opportunity to join us from all across Canada and the US and the UK. Um, and Australia as well. Great. Okay, so we have some university students that are here to learn about the dangers of gambling and some of the harms, wonderful. Jennifer Benny from Bridgeport, Connecticut is here. She works in behavioral health. I'm blown away at the amount of people that are joining us today. And not just internationally, but also from all different sectors as well. Government, regulation, treatment, prevention, research. It's great to see such a breadth of people here today to engage with us. Absolutely. I totally agree, Sasha. All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, and please continue to add in, um, you know, where you're from and what it is you'd like to learn today. I'm sure Sasha and Alex, when they go through the data, you're going to be able to pick up lots of information that you're going to find useful. And of course, we're going to be hearing from our community partners as well. So thank you for that. All right. So let's take a moment now to do a bit of a shift and review the, the agenda for today's session. So I am going to share a little bit of information with you about uh, the Responsible Gambling Council. Um, and then we're going to be moving into the actual research um, that's going to be presented by Sasha and Alex. And they're going to be taking us through uh, the key findings and key insights and recommendations that I know we're all going to find useful. As I mentioned before, there is going to be a panel discussion. And of course, there will be an opportunity for you to engage with our panel and ask questions through the Q&A session. And then we're going to go through some next steps, talk a little bit about some work happening in community uh, outreach, and then we'll have some closing remarks. 
Now, a little bit about the Responsible Gambling Council. So we are a very respected, independent, not-for-profit organization that has been providing leadership in the prevention of problem gambling in Canada and globally for over 35 years. We offer a range of services from industry accreditation, advisory and research services to prevention programming, information and support. I would encourage all of you to visit our webpage to learn more about the programs and services and information that we offer. And you can find us at www.responsiblegambling.org. And now it is my pleasure to turn this over to Sasha to begin presenting the research. Sasha? Thank you so much, Melissa. And again, hello to everyone who's joining us from across the globe and across various gambling related sectors. So as you know, today we're here, Alex and I, to speak about the research we conducted focused really on prevention and on three key communities in particular, so Chinese, South Asian, and Indigenous communities. So now let's re review a little bit about why. Why did we do this work? So in 2020, Alex and I and some other members of the Ontario Gambling Research Society did some research on impacts of COVID-19 on those who gambled in the province. And some of you who saw the, the webinar for those results saw that there were certain communities that were at higher level of risk in this study. And so this study here was in a way a follow up to some of the results that we saw there to provide us with more in-depth information and you know really bigger sampler number of people to get information from. At RGC, we've also over the past few years increased the availability of the Ministry of Health funded problem gambling prevention programs to provide resource to certain communities. And so this work was also really looking to provide specific recommendations of what those programs should look like. So what are the needs and preferences um, for things like the framing of the messaging, the content should be included, as well as the formats in which they're delivered. And really the ultimate goal is broadening not only our own, but also the broader field. So all of you here today, as well as you know beyond beyond that to additional stakeholders to improve our knowledge, to move us towards approaches that are more culturally sensitive and focused on community resilience to allow them to be more appropriate and impactful. So what did we do? We did kind of three key pieces um, as part of the study. And so the first step, which is usually the case, in, in research studies, as many of you will know, is going to the literature. So seeing what research has already been done on the topics of interest. And so our team here reviewed almost 60 articles on research in these key communities, about half of which were focused on um, people of Chinese background who gambled. We also worked with um, several organizations in the province. So we reached out to many other organizations who are working in the problem gambling space, who are working, um, who are community groups to get um, some really in-depth insights on key questions that we had. So we worked with five organizations and spoke with 11 people specifically um, in groups and individually, four of which are here today. To, to further that discussion with us. And those conversations with people were about their gambling experiences, how gambling links with family and health, as well as what they'd like to see in terms of prevention approaches. Lastly, we did an online survey with 900 people. So you can see the breakdown there. These were all people who had gambled within the past year and 80% of which had gambled online during the pandemic. We asked them similar questions. So their demographics, questions about mental health, how they gamble, how they think about gambling, as well as questions around community support, format and delivery preferences for prevention. And now to get into the results, um, I'll pass it over to Alex. Great, thank you, Sasha. Um, yeah, so I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, two ethnocultural groups that we, uh, that we included in, in this study. Um, uh, first Chinese uh, uh, gamblers and then um, South Asian gamblers and then Sasha will uh, expand the, 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 the story on uh, Indigenous gamblers in Ontario. Turning to some of the key findings and, and Sasha signposted this and I think it's, it's somewhat important to kind of put this study into context. Um, 
A year and a half ago, in August 2020, our team and, and members of the Ontario Gambling Research Society were engaged in COVID-19 research looking at the impact of the pandemic on gamblers in the province. At that time, we surveyed players asking them about their self-reported ethnocultural identity. East Asian gamblers, which included those of Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, and Mongolian descent, as well as South Asian gamblers, which included those of East Indian, Pakistani, uh, Sri Lankan, Afghani, Nepali, Bhutanese, Bangladeshi, and Maldivian descent, emerged as the largest non-white European respondent groups. Our analyses, um, given the fact that we had fairly sizable groups at that time, our analyses were able to find that these two Ontarian uh, gambling uh, populations and communities presented a concerning preliminary picture of increased health inequities relative to other Ontarian gamblers. And this was in respect to online gambling um, risks, so using uh, gambling screens, for instance, the Prom Gambling uh, Severity Index, um, higher rates of intoxicated online gambling, higher rates of moderate and severe forms of mental health problems, including anxiety and depression, and to a lesser degree, financial concerns. This study has reinforced many of these key findings with added depth and nuance. When we look at the findings from the Chinese respondents in this study, um, one of the key things that we pulled out, what we thought was quite important, was the, the finding that Ontarians of Chinese descent were significantly less likely to agree that they would have their family's unconditional support um, if their gambling habits were known. So why is this, this finding important? Why does it resonate for us? Gambling, um, we have found in this research, as well as previous research and reviews, is fairly normalized among members of the Chinese community and is accepted as a form of social recreation. Personally, I remember when I was very small, uh, hearing stories about my, my grandmother playing mahjong late into the night and early into the morning, and then coming home and boasting about how uh, she had won all of her friends' money. And then later, learning how to play and sitting down at tables with three generations of my family. Gambling in this context has cultural meaning and is important. However, when we look at modern gambling games, especially online gambling, for instance, with the potential for increasingly isolated play and higher rates of betting, the risk of losing substantial amounts of money um, in short periods of time becomes very real. And so addressing some of the the issues around responsible gambling awareness, around uh, the myths, uh, the, the misconceptions around luck, for instance, are very important. When we look at some of the other findings, for instance, not wanting to be perceived as weak, lacking awareness, believing time and access to services are barriers. What we're struck with is an, a very important um, cultural dimension and cultural concept um, in the Chinese community and Chinese culture of saving face. This in, in, in very simple terms is the, the, the intention of protecting your dignity, your honor, your personal prestige by avoiding situations where others, especially those that you care about, uh, may lose respect for you if you were to um, divulge information that reflected poorly on your character. So we wanted to learn more about the, the cultural dimensions of um, this particular uh, community. And so we turned to our community partners and we asked them, for instance, how do you think about gambling and how it's viewed in your community? And some respondents uh, uh, noted that quote, there is a very well-known Chinese saying, it's always four characters. It actually means when you gamble in small ways, it brings fun, but gambling in big ways is problematic. So it, is, it, it says that gambling can be fun and virtuous, but that it's easier said than done. When posed with the, the finding large, that large uh, portions of Chinese gamblers are introduced to gambling at a young age by family members, one respondent noted that, quote, I would say it's seen as a social activity, uh, especially for Chinese communities, there is a cultural acceptance because you get in touch with it when you're young and you don't see it as a big concern. It's part of our traditions 
it's already a big part of our culture. So taking all of this together and looking at the, the meaningful findings that we've, 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 we've collected um, and thinking about how we can turn them into recommendations. And this is, this is just a small sampling of, of, of some of those. And I would encourage everybody on this uh, webinar to read the full report. It's a very rich source of information and guidance. Um, so I highly recommend taking a look. But looking at the key findings that we, we've listed here, for instance, the fact that gambling is enjoyed as a social activity, a recreational activity during holidays and, 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 and social gatherings, for instance, um, this emphasizes the need, it provides an indicator for uh, enhanced tailored messaging uh, to encourage uh, safer gambling uh, through the provision of responsible gambling tips, positive play tips, the Responsible Gambling Council, for instance, for the past two years in particular, has made an emphasis to um, join the community, um, in the community to uh, deliver messages um, and raise awareness during Chinese New Year and Lunar Festival. Looking at help-seeking barriers that include perceived stigma, a lack of information and limited time, this is a really important recommendation that I think cross-cuts across all of these groups um, and that is to expand programs, uh, educational messaging that specifically targets um, close social relations, including uh, family members of gamblers to de decrease stigma um, uh, associated with uh, gambling related harms. I think one of the, there are two things. One is to try to address stigma by recruiting and educating family members and close uh, social relations so that they become first responders and this also helps to overcome some of the institutional distrust in accessing some of the more formal uh, services that are already available. And then finally, uh, looking at over half um, of the uh, respondents, uh, the Chinese respondents in our survey, um, noting that you know they're more comfortable receiving this information through social uh, social media, um, through internet uh, communication, so on and so forth. This is really sort of um, a re-emphasis of, of sort of how we've pivoted um, by necessity uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but something that is, is certainly worth uh, building on. Turning to South Asian gamblers, through this research, um, and review of other studies, for instance, we've learned that gambling as a social activity with friends and family can be perceived as a normal form of recreation among some South Asian communities. As gambling moves to more formal and traditional brick and mortar and online forms, stigma may grow. In our preliminary study in, in 2020, we noted that South Asian gamblers were far more likely to typically engage in a mix of online and land-based gambling and this is a fairly consistent predictor of risk. We also found um, that uh, South Asian gamblers in this preliminary study were over two and a half times more likely to be screened as moderate and high risk gamblers. Mode, and they were also typically motivated um, to gamble online in response to COVID-19, as well as uh, to earn income. Um, and report, in addition, higher rates of severe anxiety and depression, as well as intoxicated online gambling under the influence of alcohol. Findings from this most recent study, unfortunately, reinforce this risk profile um, and add emphasis uh, a more pr prevalent negative impacts of problem gambling from close relations, such as spouses and siblings. So, when looking at the, the key findings, one of the ones that we pulled out that we thought was particularly important was that Ontarians of South Asian descent who gamble represent the community with the greatest need uh, of risk and harm, um, the greatest need for risk prevention, rather. So why is this important um, besides the obvious? In considering these findings as an indicator of a potential need in the community for supports and resources, and also taking into consideration the perceived barriers to help seeking, we're faced with a dilemma. The dilemma requires a better understanding of gambling in South Asian communities in Ontario um, to overcome some of these barriers. And so we turn to our uh, community partners to provide a little bit more context 
to perhaps guidance in this regard. When asked, how do, gam uh, how, how do you think about gambling uh, or how do you think gambling is viewed in your community? One respondent uh, noted that quote, sometimes I see South Asians as having a more relaxed attitude and gambling uh, on gambling uh, if it's in the household, like cards for small sums of money. A lot of people in the community don't view these activities as gambling. They are at home, it's social, it's fun, etc. But if you're going out um, to the casino, then it's seen as a gambling problem. If you gamble outside of the family home, it becomes a problem. When presented with the finding, South Asian gamblers are less likely to be open about their gambling habits with family members as they're concerned about the potential reaction. One respondent noted that often problem gambling is seen as a moral weakness that they are unable to practice self-control. So this negative view can impact the family as well, having members of the community feeling as if the family wasn't effective in raising the child or that there are additional problems. Shame and guilt are really common within many South Asian communities. So it makes it harder for gamblers to reach out. Uh, and generally um, they just remain quiet. So taking all of this together um, and trying to think about ways to move forward with recommendations, for instance, we focused in on uh, a few here, um, key findings such as the, 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 the finding that the South Asian gamblers are more likely to experience moderate and high levels of gambling risk. Um, well, I think this, is, this re emphasizes our need to uh, continue and enhance our promotion and the normalization of positive play and uh, sustainable forms of gambling if, if uh, individuals are going to gamble, anyways. Um, the finding that you know, more like uh, South Asian gamblers are more likely to engage in intoxicated online gambling, this in particular, um, being a very strong predictor of, of gambling risk, needs to be addressed and denormalized. Um, intoxicated gambling is uh, a significant issue and is also, uh, as, as we see with the legalization of sports betting, um, a potentially a, a, another major issue. And again, um, looking at help-seeking barriers um, that relate to uh, shame and guilt, there is an added emphasis and need to engage you know, community members, family members to educate, to provide relevant information so that they can act as first responders and promote resilience within the community um, that can be augmented by more formal forms of uh, support in the field. And I'll, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Sasha. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. So I'm going to review some of what we found in the research literature as well as our, our conversations and survey on Indigenous peoples in Ontario who gamble. So similar to Alex's walkthrough, I'll begin with some key findings in the area um, on this topic that we found. So one key piece noted um, It seems we have a bit of a problem. We've lost uh, Sasha. Can, yep. Oh, I hear her. Okay, there you go. Great. <laughs> um, which some um, communities um, are in, in Canada have a high level of engagement with as well as related problems. So there's been some shifts over time in the types of games played and in those ways, some negative impacts as well. So we see that throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, um, that Indigenous peoples had a lower odds of playing online during this time compared to the, the other two um, communities that we were looking at, but also that they made up the largest proportion of those who were reporting an increase in the money spent online throughout that time. So while engaging in that behavior wasn't necessarily as widespread among the Indigenous peoples in Ontario that we, we surveyed, that they were engaging in this, you know, bit of a higher risk behavior in terms of spending quite a bit um, while gambling online. We also, as you see here, asked several questions about what were some of the key barriers to help seeking, knowing that these are the things that we want to overcome 
as you've seen with um, Alex outlining kind of the key recommendations to support with the provision of prevention information as well as accessing of resources. And so what we saw were that's, you know, the one of the main barriers uh, import, uh, reported was over half of people noting that the location of services was an issue. And Indigenous people were more likely to report this locations of service issue um, over twice as often as people from the, the other two communities that we spoke with. We saw a difference between men and women in reporting lack of awareness, um, as well as for being a barrier to resource um, use and access, where um, all twice as many of the, the women um, of Indigenous backgrounds that we spoke to reported this as being a barrier for them. So thinking of things um, in terms of awareness of resources that are available both kind of online as well as in the community, which we'll chat a little bit about more later. And also um, another barrier that was reported over twice as much among the Indigenous people that we surveyed was not wanting to be perceived as weak or judged. And so this ties in a bit um, to some of the results we'll discuss um, in a moment as well. Some kind of resilience aspects that were noted in the survey were that um, those uh, the gamblers, pe people who gambled in Ontario of Indigenous backgrounds were uh, roughly two times more likely to report high levels of those positive play beliefs and behaviors. So these are essentially um, views on how one should gamble or approaches when one does gamble. So whether or not you set money limits, whether or not you stick to them, whether it's your responsibility to um, consider these things, that they had higher rates of engaging in those beliefs and behaviors, which is, of course, very encouraging um, for supporting the, the reductions in some of the you know, things like increased spend online. And also, there was really a strong um, sense of family support. So over, so over 75% of those that we um, surveyed from Indigenous backgrounds in Ontario reported that they strongly felt that their family, if they found out about their gambling habits, that they would be supported unconditionally. So let's look now at some responses um, that some of the community members that we spoke to um, provided to us when we were having conversations with them. So when they were asked, do you think there are barriers to accessing information on and support for gambling in your community? So things like what we've discussed already, language, location, cultural relevancy, and if so, what are they? So one respondent replied, my grandma would say, I don't want to go to counseling. I want to go to the sacred fire. And she would sit there for days in the bush and she would have her berry fasting and other ceremonies to help her with healing. So those cultural resources are important. And I see it as well where people can request things like sweat lodges, discussions with elders, land-based treatments to help with their addictions. I like that I see the hospital that has been coming into our community that incorporates smudging and other stuff like that. So this quote really highlights that preference for, as well as the importance of culturally relevant supports and approaches. But as we've seen in the previous results, often location is, location is an issue, um, access or awareness of resources so that availability piece is still limited in many ways. Respondents were also asked, um, so some research has suggested that Indigenous peoples who have experienced gambling-related harm rely more on family and friends for support rather than external health services. What are your thoughts on these findings? So kind of echoing that, you know, over three quarters report feeling strongly supported um, was this response here by one, one interviewee. So a lot of people want to be involved in their community for the healing process. Part of it is isolation but other people just want to make sure they are practicing their culture. Going to a city takes time and there is not too many culturally relevant programs. A lot of people turn to their cultural ways to help them, so they prefer to talk to elders and knowledge keepers. I have nothing against outside help. I just saw that a lot of my help came from traditional ways and I think that's the same for a lot of people. So this quote really ties in the links between having culturally relevant approaches um, the location of them, as well as the importance for support from community members. And so now that we have reviewed some of these, um, you know, key insights that we pulled out, again, recommend you going to the report. There's so much more in there. Um, but let's move to what are some recommendations from some of these um, key findings? So as we discussed, there's a lot of um, barriers that were noted. So that location question is key. 
um, some issues with, uh, you know, the trauma, the legacy of residential schools causing some barriers, as well as a lack of culturally relevant programs, as you saw in some of those quotes. So approaches to support in, in some of these ways across these various barriers can be focusing essentially both online and in community, having that variety of access options. And doing so can increase the awareness of resources that are available. So things like um, sharing on social media, as you see below, um, as well as things that are locally available. And also increase access while also increasing and supporting cultural relevance. So it addresses a couple of things by having this variety of resources available. We also, as we saw, saw that services are viewed as not offering too much confidentiality by some respondents. Um, and again, the, the issue of cultural relevance was very prominent and important. So one way to support this is to utilize indigenous practices in our prevention programming. And so there's some work that's been done in Australia um, and learning from other mental health programs, so things like substance use, that a collaborative, culturally sensitive and family focused approach can be really useful. So this can include things like focusing on community engagement, integrating the culture specifically into the program, building capacity at the community level, and part of this can include partnering with community service organizations. As I noted, social media was one um, kind of delivery format that was preferred by over two thirds of respondents. And so you can see here some of the main delivery methods were um, social media, booths at gambling venues, so kind of that community-based piece. And so again, here in terms of format, it's a kind of a combination of that online and community-based set of options that can provide the variety um, that people are seeking to, to have to overcome some of these barriers. And so lastly, we saw that um, in a lot of research studies, that gambling behaviors were associated with higher level of stress, higher mental health concerns, and other issues in this, in this space of kind of well-being. And so ways to support this are similar to what Alex was saying about focusing on that minim minimizing harms question. So this can be linking with resources. So knowing that some of the, these experiences go together, some of them are intertwined. So providing gambling supports with mental health resort supports. As well as a spe specific recommendation in the research to balance other activities with responsible gambling on that um, kind of topic of balance specifically, because this aligns really well with the concept of wellness in many indigenous communities. So now that we've talked about kind of the, the learning specifically for these three communities, we'd like to pull things together a little bit on some general takeaways that can be useful in, in developing culturally um, sensitive and, and relevant programming. So the first is around tailoring messaging to acknowledge a community's values and views about gambling. So as Alex mentioned as well, there's a lot of meaning and value and cultural views and importance around gambling behaviors, around time spent gambling, around what that means for family members, for communities. And so tailoring things in this way, taking those into consideration allows you to account for this cultural perspective that is so important. And in doing so, we avoid pathologizing gambling or advocating for abstinence entirely, which would not be appropriate in those circumstances. And in doing so, we can shift to things like focusing on safer play strategies. So it's not about don't gamble, it's about how can you do it in a way that minimizes harm. The next general takeaway is about offering gambling prevention materials in appropriate languages. And so one of the keys here is for it to not be a translation from English, for it not to just be translated from an existing material, what for it to be developed in the language to use examples to use wording that is relevant and from the specific and appropriate languages of the communities to support again with that cultural relevancy piece. Collaboration, we've noted this several times about supporting or working with community leaders and members. So it's about aligning resources and supporting each other. Um, about sharing resources where we have them and learning from others' knowledge um, as much as possible. It's about co-development 
um, as well as co-dissemination of prevention materials. And in, in, the, in this way, um, authentically including and acknowledging values as well as finding the most appropriate ways to address misconceptions. A fourth way is to expand prevention and education as, as we discussed several times to engage family members. So that question of stigma um, was brought up several times, both in terms of how supported you would feel by your family members, your community, or the accessing or preferences for supports. And so focusing on family members can support increasing the awareness, not only of resources that are available, but as well as what are the broader impacts and signs of gambling harm. And lastly, in terms of delivery format, to offer these um, awareness programs messages in a way that is receptive to the audience. So as we saw, each one of the communities that we chatted about today had different preferences. Social media went across them. Some of them preferred television, some of them not so much. Um, so it's about offering the messages not only in a way and in a frame and with content that is most relevant, but also um, in a format that is most relevant and preferred as well. And so I hope you all committed all five of these to memory because it's poll time. So please go back again to menti.com. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too much. It looked actually looked like it wasn't too much of an issue for people earlier with the great response we got to our warm up question, our icebreaker. So while you go to there on your phone, I'll give you a preview of what the question is for those who may be having internet issues like I am. Um, which of these recommendations, so of the five I was just discussing, do you think you would use in your work that would be most applicable, that would maybe be most impactful to some of the work that you're doing, knowing that you're all from various jurisdictions as well as kind of sectors within the gambling field? So again, a reminder, those are culturally specific messaging, including family and programming, materials in different languages, collaborating with communities, and using various methods to reach audiences. <clears throat> All right, it looks like we have results coming in. Oh, this is really fun to watch this happen in real time. Yeah, it's a new tool. Okay, happy to see none of the above. So it looks like we're getting some around culturally specific messaging. That seems to be quite a high one. Kind of equal levels of people reporting materials in different languages as well as collaborating with communities. Seems really well spread out. Actually, now they're evening out. So culturally specific messaging, I think, is um, winning out as kind of one of the top approaches that it seems like everyone would be interested in implementing and most impactful. Alex, any thoughts? I was just thinking we should, probably should have included an all of the above option. <laughs> That'll be one of our learnings for the next webinar. Yeah, yeah, I guess one of the things that struck, uh, struck me um, is sort of the relative lower um, incidence of uh, people responding with including family and programming. I think that's such a daunting task, um, especially for people that are, in, you know, involved in, in, in policy and programming, but I'd be really interested to, to hear from perhaps some, some individuals who are working in the treatment field um, and how they've, you know, leveraged relationships with family in order to, um, you know, deliver services or enhance their services. Excellent. So thanks everyone for participating in our mentee poll and Maybe remember your responses, or if there's any questions that this, this exercise or our recommendations pulled for you, that to um, consider them uh, for the panel Q&A as well that's coming up. So I'll pass it over to Melissa now to get us started on our panel with our um, community organizations. Wonderful. Thank you both Sasha and Alex for walking us through the findings of the study, which you know really highlighted some unique and important nuances that we all need to appreciate and consider when engaging with our three communities. Um, very clearly, uh, culture, it needs to be culturally relevant and culturally appropriate. 
And I am pleased, um, as I mentioned earlier now, to introduce again our community panel, who I think is going to add further um, perspective, insight, and context to, um, you know, really bring to life a lot of the feedback that we just heard uh, from the findings. So I'm going to go ahead and reintroduce um, our partners. So we have Baldev Mutta, again, the founder and CEO of the Punjabi Community Health Services, Vince Pia Petralo, General Manager of Family and Mental Health Services at Costi Immigrant Services, Albert Yu, President and CAO of Diversity Communications, Inc., and Jasmine Chagger, co-founder of the SOCH Mental Health Organization. Now, in advance of today's session, our panelists were given a set of questions to respond to that I will share with you. Um, and then what I think I will do is call on, on each of them individually to respond to the ones that they feel they really wanted to provide some feedback towards. So the questions that we had provided were, uh, is there a particular finding or recommendation from the research that resonated with them? We wanted to know what some of the challenges uh, they can encountered in delivering gambling-focused programming. We wanted to learn some of the important things to consider and what has been successful in their gambling uh, focus programming that they provide. And we wanted them to provide us some insight on what more we should be doing in this space. So Albert, perhaps I will start with you if you want to share some insight across the four questions that were provided. Yes, I think um, in, the, in our area of marketing communications, it is uh, very important that we have research findings to validate our insights. So, you know, uh, the, the report uh, has been very, very useful, very illuminating. Yes, yeah, so I think I find one of the findings that is uh, uh, very interesting is, as you, you pointed out earlier, the majority of Chinese and South Asian gamblers consider they may not be receiving unconditional support from the family members if they knew of their gambling behaviors and problems. So I, th I think, you know, in, in the poll that you recently just, just did just now, uh, that particular aspect seems to be uh, a lower compared to other. Yes, therefore, I, I think we should rebalance the strategy in terms of, of reevaluating the, the, the education of the family members to support if it can be effective or not due to the cultural dynamics uh, of Chinese and South Asians. Perhaps stronger resources, to directly educate the gamblers on the tips of, of safer play, uh, introduce them to, to available help, uh, maybe more productive in, in producing better return on investment. That would be my point of view on the first aspect of, of one finding. Great, thank you, Albert. Jasmeet. Thank you. Um, yes, I definitely agree with um, the finding about targeting the family. And I also found it interesting that in the poll, um, that was one of the least selected options. And as a registered nurse, you know, working um, in the field for the past 10 years, I can definitely understand from a clinical perspective how difficult it can be um, to engage the family. In my personal experience um, at different organizations I've worked at, we were always told or the culture was that the client is the client, the family is not. Right? There's not a lot of resources to provide that education to the family or, you know, it's a systems level barrier that we don't perceive the family as an extension of that client. And when you're talking about gambling, you know, mental health is such a huge aspect, not just for the person that has um, an issue with gambling, but for the family. So I definitely want everyone here to really consider, you know, if you are in a clinical background, um, how is your understanding or your perspective on working with the family? Um, what are the barriers that you may currently be encountering in um, educating the family or working with the family from a systems level issue? Is there something that you can do within your organization to kind of change that culture or within your own team um, where the family does become the focus. Because if you're just providing education and awareness to the per person that has um, a, a concern with problem gambling, but you're not addressing you know, the concerns of the family, especially from a South Asian perspective, because we do tend to live in extended families, 
then that's a huge gap that we're missing. Because if the family is not provided education about general gambling, what the person is going through, um, how they can support themselves, the impact on themselves, then I feel like we're missing a huge picture of um, supporting the individual as well as their family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's great feedback. Again, you know, the harms aren't just experienced by the actual players. It's the whole family circle around them. Very, very important. Thank you, Jasmine. Vince. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. And um, first of all, I agree with Alex. We should have had um, an opportunity to say all of them because that what resonated um, sort of that resonated with me um, working at its designated treatment center with ethnocultural communities, the importance of all those issues uh, and recommendations when we're crafting messages. But the one that everybody chose, which is culturally relevant messaging, is, is the one that struck me as well. Because if you see how gambling behaviors are shaped, um, cultures have internalized certain messages that are historical. Um, about gambling and gambling behavior. When it moves outside of social engagements and goes to isolated kinds of experiences, you start to have problematic behaviors. Um, and, and that came across clear. But to me, the influence not only in gambling, in gambling behaviors that is culturally ingrained, it also prohibits help-seeking behaviors. And that's what really struck me about this study, because that affirms what we see in that, and you look across the board, both in the indigenous community, as well in, as in the Chinese community, the cultural view of counseling or any intervention as being perceived as weak, as somehow challenging um, the masculinity, the essence of the person, um, mm -hmm. and that limits the ability for someone to get help. And this is why what we see in, in uh, treatment centers is that people eventually come for help when the secret is out and then the family feels incredibly betrayed and there's catastrophic kinds of um, issues that come out like financial ruin at, at, at the verge of losing one's house. Um, and by that time, it becomes um, initially you're helping with someone with bankruptcy issues, right? Before you can even get into treatment issues. And the rage and anger is really hard to include the family in any kind of meaningful way until things kind of calm down. So in seeing the help-seeking behaviors, and what I, I thought also would be important is the lack of knowledge and misperceptions about the counseling process and intervention, whether it's around confidentiality that we saw and, and people perceive or at least believe that their confidentiality will be again um, compromised. And this is all comes out of cultural beliefs, I think, um, as well as perhaps the lack of knowledge about what counseling is to begin with. And, and this is why um, one thing that I think the, re the report leads to is to not just provide resources about where places are located or culturally responsive or adapted programs that include culture in their treatment, but also what counseling is, what it entails, what the outcomes could be, and how effective changes um, can be, um, can be a, a positive outcome. And, and then engage the family, not when they're angry, right? But this is historically where we've had an issue is, is that, that people come at the end of the road and not mm -hmm. really when we start to see the initial. So anyway, congratulations on the study. It affirms our anecdotal beliefs. Now there's finally some evidence when we're crafting our messaging that our counselors and our community workers can use when they're presenting. So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you for that, Vince. Baldev, interested to hear some comments from you and if you can maybe share um, some anecdotes on what's been successful for your organization and some of the programming that you provide. Um, thank you. Um, so one of the things, one of the lessons learned in the in the clinical practice at Punjabi Community Health Services is that we have included screening questions around gambling in all our mental health and addiction programming. 
So we have these, these standalone programs. So there's a mental health program and then there is this an addictions program. So in these uh, intake process and in the orientation, there are standard questions. And what this has led us is that we are able to engage the client, uh, not only those clients who are coming to us with specific gambling related issues, but also individuals that may have addiction and mental health as their dominant thing that we can say, okay, what my, uh, uh, what might be other issues that might be affecting? So that's one of the key lessons that uh, that is very important. So uh, so that the the uh, uh, so that during the screening, these questions also come out. That's one. The second point that I wanted to mention is around health equity. At the systems level. I, I feel that we are still discussing cultural responsiveness, cultural appropriateness, and the uh, various kind of you know, uh, models or modalities of treatment. I think there comes a time when we have to simply say uh, there is, shouldn't be any more discussions around it. We should be just grounding in the best practice about these things to begin with. In 2022, to still talk about cultural relevance, I think it takes us back. It means that as Canada, that we are still contemplating, discussing whether family should be included, whether there should be some uh, uh, a treatment that is much more inclusive. I, I just find it kind of you know, difficult to digest that we have been working on this issue for a long time. I mean, look at the experience of Costi. For last, I think about 50 years, they've been putting this uh, uh, thing first with the Italian community and then subsequently with many other different communities. And now we have the experiences from the Chinese organizations, the South Asian organization, and where is this collective consciousness and the experiences going? If mainstream organizations are not adapting, I think it's a doing a disservice to the majority of the, the communities that we are you now serving. So my thing uh, uh, recommendation would be, what is one thing that I'm recommending? Make family inclusive treatment process. If you are having difficulty including a family, well, then your clinical counselor may perhaps look at getting additional uh, uh, learnings, how to be become more inclusive. Like at, at PCHS, we are a family-centered. We don't say we are a client-centered. We say we are a family-centered organization. At the beginning of every single thing, the family is included. Every single thing. And if you want to exclude a family, you have to actually say to the counselor, I would like my family to be excluded. It's the other way around. So in the mainstream organization, you start with an individual client and then you kind of you know, request the family to be included. We are the other way around. We start with the family and the client has the option to say, no, I would only like to work with me. And 95% of our clients don't have any problem. And that's the big thing that I would like to say at this time. 95% of our clients do not have a problem of engaging a family member that they would like to be involved in the assessment and treatment, developing a care plan, and then subsequent intervention and recovery. So those are the two things that I wanted to uh, kind of you know, leave my impression. And I agree with everyone else that has you know, so eloquently talked about their experiences in treatment. Great feedback, Balda, thank you. I would love to open up the floor um, to our panelists, perhaps to speak a little bit more about what else you feel we should be doing uh, more of in this space. Um, so Jasmine, if, Jasmine, if I could throw it back to you. I saw you nodding emph emphatically when Balda was speaking. So I know a lot of what he said had resonated with you and perhaps you can share um, some of your experiences from your organization as well. Yes, I, I loved everything Paul Dave said. I can listen to him all the time. Just so much experience. Um, no, I definitely agree with everything that everyone is saying. Um, with our organization, so we don't offer direct service such as PCHS. We actually focus on more of the health promotion piece. So before there is a problem, um, we essentially want to 
um, educate our South Asian community that mental health and the various aspects that come with it, such as problem gambling, that these things can impact anybody and anyone. So let's start these conversations early. So we actually get a lot of inquiries from family members themselves about various addictive behaviors such as problem gambling. So it's not for us, it's not always the individual that has the concern that is emailing us and asking for support. It's always the family members, right? So from that perspective, we try to do, um, you know, online campaigns or like educational workshops that focus on the family and what the impact is for themselves. And we found that storytelling is really successful. And I know in the findings um, across the, the communities, there was a lot of discussion about stigma. So when it comes to storytelling, which is actually one of, um, you know, the Mental Health Commission's um, anti-stigma um, strategies on contact-based education, if you can find individuals from, um, for example, any community, the South Asian community that are able to share their story um, with problem gambling, or you have family members that are able to come out and share these stories, it actually gives the community hope and strength that I'm not the only one that's going through a situation like this. Because there's so much stigma, um, when someone actually comes forward and shares their story, it's like, oh, there's other people in the community that are going through this. So maybe I can get support for myself or get support for my family. And when it comes to talking about your story, it doesn't always have to be serious. I know when it comes to mental health, oftentimes, you know, that stigma is there that it's such a heavy topic. But in our um, experience, we found that, um, you know, using the creative arts, that's one way that you can tackle such a heavy topic, such a stigmatized topic. Um, you know, we've used um, short films, the arts to really showcase stories so that the community is able to get that messaging um, using their ethnic language, using their culture at the forefront. And um, I know um, Sasha had mentioned um, like different communities prefer different modalities. So for us, what has really worked is the use of ethnocultural um, media outlets. So going on TV shows where, um, you know, South Asian languages are present. Primarily, we have started focusing on the Punjabi community. I'm going on different radios that cater to the Punjabi community. So I think these are some of the recommendations um, that I can put forward um, that have really worked for our community. That's great. Thanks, Jasmine. And so, so speaking to the attendees on this session, you're hearing lots of rich um, feedback and information from our partners. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is if you would like to ask our panelists a question, please open up the Q&A tool um, that you will find on your screen and start typing them in and we'll be able to try our best to get as many of them answered as possible. So please start doing that now. I'd like to turn back to our panelists and see if there are any um, closing comments to the research or any other insights or feedback that you would like to provide before we jump into the Q&A. Albert, can I start with you? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's been a great uh, uh, discussion, uh, very inspiring too. So I think, you know, to do, there's lots more to be done in this space. I, I can, you know, there, I believe the responsible gambling messaging we are required to step up in the next uh, few years. I consider three reasons for, for, for the thinking. First of all, we all recognize there is a significant growth in the ethnic population in Ontario, and it is expected to continue very strongly in the coming years. So I think in, in our business of, of uh, multicultural marketing, uh, we definitely recognize there's a clear difference between cultural uh, lens Chinese versus South Asian, et cetera, et cetera. So in the area of, of, of gambling, it's, it's particularly nuanced and it's delicate. For example, in a, in a Chinese uh, uh, situation, the, the uh, family members can all be going to the casino together as if it's a recreational activity. So the, the, the parents' influence in, in the activity can be very small the, uh, versus in the South Asian uh, community, they don't wish the, the parents to know that they're in this behavior. So there's distinctive differences between uh, different cultures and their, and their perception regarding the gambling activity. 
So I think that the nuanced communication for each ethnic group is, is quite important. The second aspect I, I consider uh, very, very uh, uh, critically for the coming years is there is there seems to be a great liberalization of gambling uh, in casinos, in online betting, in sports betting that appears to be popularizing gambling as 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 general culture as almost popular culture. So in in the ethnic population in Canada, a majority of these immigrants are first generation immigrant Canadians. Huge majority of them, first generation immigrant Canadians. And they may interpret by being Canadian, which they all love to be, and that gambling is part of Canadian culture. Therefore, by being Canadian, I should participate in gambling activity. And they, that may break down their cultural values and put, for example, the South Asian Canadians, uh, South Asian groups more at, more at risk. So that seems to be a, a, a danger here as, as the general subject of gambling and being fun it's more uh, promoted. The third area, I think, which is obviously topical, we recognize the pandemic has produced very vulnerable mental health issues and it's heightening the risk of online gambling. People can be doing it in their own room mm -hmm. and people don't notice it. So, you know, in, in the combination of all these three factors in the ethnic uh, marketing space, it is developing in, into a, a phenomenon. It's a very risky situation. Therefore, I, I strongly recommend the council uh, to be evaluating promoting efforts uh, uh, in, in responsible gambling and all, all the risks that may be involved in this. That's my point of view. Wonderful, thank you, Albert. Vince, closing remarks and last thoughts. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for the study because it really is going to inform our work and it and is very important. And, and getting back to what Baldev said, um, collectively, I think as a society, an inclusive society, we move towards, we need to move towards cultural humility, um, different from cultural competence, different um, from cultural relevancy. And, and what that entails is that we all kind of walk in each other's shoes, right? We all, as an inclusive community, understand each other's culture and moving that because casinos do that very, very well. They have a way of marketing to um, ethnic communities in very specific ways that engage them, whether it's bringing in uh, superstars from China to come and, and, and fill the casino. And this is, I guess, pre-COVID because we haven't seen much of that. And I've seen this in the Italian community as well, where they bring in stars to get people to participate. But overall, I think I agree with Albert, the normalization of gambling as a recreational activity. And this is why it's really important that the study points out that you need to have targeted um, messaging for each community about what is normalizing and what and when is it harmful right and distinguishing and discriminating between the two and also what i would say it, need, that it needs to be some consistency right that it isn't um often times when we're we're targeting ethnocultural communities and specifically that the campaigns are one-off there isn't that consistency um and sustainability and continued messaging that is so important. Um, and, and that's what I would say. That's the other thing that I think is really, really important is this continues. I know sometimes it's an issue of resource and, and resources, but having that continued sustainability is really, really important. Otherwise the message disappears over a period of time. Thank you, Vince. Baldev, any last remarks? Uh, uh, I, I, um... Uh, I don't have any any last rem remarks, Melissa. I'm, I'm just going to pass because I think much has been said already. I so too. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Okay. So let's shift for a few moments over to some questions that we have um, from our participants for you, the panel. So I'm just here looking at the screen. Okay. My apologies, I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing these. When we, okay, so we have a comment here. Um, when we have Chinese or South Asian customers who look for RG materials, is there an opportunity to leverage technology and have representatives of their community speak to them 
live in live time when needed. So the, this is a thought again of having, I guess, real time representatives from the communities where people are looking for support, um, you know, to have someone that they can identify with to speak. And I'm wondering if any of our organizations offer this or think that this would be a viable approach for support for um, problem gambling. Um, I, but just quickly, uh, I think that uh, uh, when Jasmeet mentioned about raising awareness, that's one component where they talk about you know, with specific examples, specific TV, radio programs, catering to specific audiences, that could be one approach. From a clinical perspective, I think it's important for the clinician to be uh, really aware of what exactly uh, are some of the nuances in the treatment process around gambling. Uh, I think that is important. And I think maybe that is what the, uh, the, the, the question is all about that. How do we include uh, uh, those treatment things or those nuances in a clinical intervention setting that may perhaps uh, uh, increase the ability of the person to be connected with the clinician? Vince, what do you think is, was that the answer? <clears throat> That, that was a big part of the answer in terms of intervention, but getting back to what the, the question was, I think having live time, what I was gonna say, the Ontario Problem Gambling Helpline is available in many different languages, right? And I do think moving forward, and, and, and so people can contact. Um, so that is um, an immediate way, but I don't think any of us have 24, 24 hour, um, seven day a week service for someone to connect, and I don't, and and I don't think other than the, uh, the helpline. Um, I do think we have a response time, and here's the key. And I think the question is actually really important because you people will, generally speaking, our um, our experience has been that people who have gambling issues reach out when they're really in crisis. And then by the time you get back to them, they may disappear, right? They may have found another solution or the anxiety um, has reduced or they found another way um, not to engage. And this is the individual. Um, and eventually, as, as others have said, it's the family that calls because then they realize that they check a bank account or a visa statement comes in and then all hell breaks loose, right? Um, and people do more digging. Um, but it would be great if we could connect somehow, but that is a difficult issue, right? To navigate that other than the helpline that will then call us because people gamble on weekends, right? We're not available. Um, that's when people have for the most part. So, um, Okay, great. So we have another question. Um, how can we use this information to help with youth gambling awareness programs? Any insights from our panels? Um, how, well, I do believe that youth growing up in ethnic homes have also internalized a lot of the cultural messaging. So some of it is still going to resonate because beliefs around gambling and gambling behaviors start within the culture, within the family. Um, and then, of course, um, intersecting with um, and I think as Albert said, right? I think you had mentioned Albert that there is an assimilation process. But I mean, my background, I can speak personally. I was born in Italy, came here when I was three. So I pretty much grew up here. But some of the cultural message that um, I, I was sort that I've internalized, so powerful, so with me, you have to sometimes do a double check, right? Um, around how to think, how to perceive, and how to deal with a, uh, a situation. So I do believe this could also definitely be used for youth um, because depending on the age group, the power of, of the culture, they're still engaged in cultural events. Um, they're still living the culture in, in their homes, right? So, and, and it still plays a very strong um strong influence in, in, in the way they think and behave, I believe. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has any other comments related to youth. That, that's just my, um, my perception. I think the, the youth group um, as a subject, it's, it's, 
it's very important for um, for us to pay attention to this group because it it can be a rather risky group. On one hand, as Vince described, there there is family influence within the ethic home, so there are you know influences and and family values that balances it. What I like to point out though is the group of youth in under students category, international students who are here on their own in universities finding. Uh, uh, gambling activity, um, uh, recreational or entertainment, and then very quickly down the slippery slope. So the international student group is very, it's rather big. And how we, how can we be helping them to to be aware of of the dangers and the risks? And it can be done with with media uh, to to reach that particular group because that can be a, 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 they can be very much at risk too. Great. Next question. We know confidentiality is a barrier to seeking help. Any advice on how we can help people feel more comfortable to reaching out? Well, I, I, we did a study at Costi, um, similar, not as broadened um, as the scope of this and not with the sample size this particular study has around uh, help seeking um, behaviors and and of course confidentially confidentiality did come up i think there needs to be education um, and messaging around the process of counseling we developed at costi we developed an animation video to educate the communities we work with around what exactly is the counseling process for instance um one of the myths that came out in the report by some of the communities is well we can't afford to go into treatment well, in Ontario, problem gambling treatment is free, including including residential treatment. So people who have serious gambling issues and require residential treatment, inpatient treatment is free. Um, you have to get to Windsor and have to be referred. And in most designated um, treatment centers like CAMH, Costi, Chinese Family Life of Ontario, these services are free. So the more information we have about the counseling process, how we ensure confidentiality through contracts um, and, and through process, creating safe spaces, um, what the outcomes of counseling will be, how it essentially works, removes a lot of the myths. Um, so that, that that's one way I think we need to move forward with respect to a, a dealing with some of that with confidentiality. I don't know if anybody else has any other viewpoints and, um, and other experiences that they've had in their community. I agree with what you're saying, Vince. Um, with us at Soj, we've also made um, several videos on privacy, confidentiality, what counseling is, what happens at a session, um, and we've made them in Punjabi uh, because nothing like that really exists for the community. So it's really important to get that messaging across in that cultural context, in that language. And it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning when um, Sasha was talking about the general guidelines that we can't just translate the material um, we can't just translate something from English about privacy and confidentiality into various ethnic languages because that cultural context is missing, especially like I'm speaking about the South Asian community, you know, in certain South Asian countries, um, there is so much um, that they don't know about privacy and confidentiality, and then they bring that here, right? So um, you may have been here in Canada for, t you know, 20, 30 years, but you still may not understand the healthcare system and that, um, you know, privacy and confidentiality is very respected and it's not like it is back home where your community is going to find out necessarily. So really, um, you know, using... Um, the language, using the culture, using that ethnic media, using uh, the creative lens to create those messaging, those videos, I think it's really important. And now that we're in a virtual world, um, I'm speaking from our perspective because we do a lot of online workshops now um, that can actually promote privacy and confidentiality because you can log on um, 
to Zoom or whatever platform you're using, using a different name. Um, you don't have to turn on your camera. So this is primarily for, you know, those preventative um, approaches for family members, for even individuals that have um, issues with problem gambling. If you're doing these educational workshops on a virtual platform, um, that's something that has worked for us. We try to promote it that way, that you can log on, no one's going to know it's you because you're behind the screen. Thank you for that response, Jasmeet. We have another question. So this participant says, I work in a technology company where part of the business is providing technology backbone for gambling companies around the world. Since a wide array of companies are targeted, cultural messaging is not as beautiful, more tedious and costly to implement. How do you foresee technology companies continuing to adopt responsible gambling in the future? Any right. feedback or thoughts on that? Or perhaps Sasha or um, Alex could also jump in to answer as well. I think, uh, Melissa, one of the things that I would suggest to the uh, corporate world who are in the business of developing is to understand uh, whether their activities will enhance problems within certain ethnic communities or not. Uh, for example, reading this report would be helpful to them. Uh, uh, understanding what are the issues that certain communities face and, and how are the young people gravitating. I know that my own nephew uh, recently at a Super Bowl game, uh, he was betting on it. And I, I looked at him and I said, are you betting? He says, yeah, I am betting. So, uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't something that is acceptable. And then we had a discussion with him and to our surprise, to his mom's surprise, actually, not to mine, I kind of you know, guessed started, it, but to his, his mom's surprise, uh, it is a big thing amongst his friends circle. This is what they do. They bet on Raptors game. They bet on the Super Bowl or on the, on the football games. They bet on ice hockey teams. This is the trend amongst young people. Are we putting them at risk? I think it's a corporate social responsibility. Perhaps they should you know, take a critical look at uh, how can they be a, 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 a corporation that is socially responsible. That, that's what I would recommend. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I would say it's worth the investment considering how diverse Canada is um, and, and all the number of different languages. So I think that if you invest, um, and, and we see this with very progressive companies where, um, and, and the example I'm gonna use is RBC, which has historically, um, at least as part of their campaigns and messaging, is to include diverse people in their ads, um, reach out to immigrant and refugee populations for banking needs. Um, and we've seen the success um, in their programming, right? So I would encourage all corporations to look at diversity as a strength um, and, and move towards that because it is, um, look at Toronto, <laughs> just look around, right? I, I, I mean, and, is it, and it's moving in further and further. Um, most of the immigrants and ethnic populations are actually north of Toronto and moving into some of the rural. And if we hear about, and not just on Ontario, but across Canada as well, you're starting to see strong ethnic communities in Edmonton and Calgary, parts of BC, well, for BC historically, Nova Scotia now. So this is really, really, it's worth the investment, I would say. Great. Albert, you're from a communications organization. What's your thought? I was smiling when uh, Vince uh, mentioned the RBC example because uh, thanks for the shout out, Vince, because diversity has been working as RBC's multicultural agency for the past 17 years consistently. So thanks for recognizing and, and highlighting the work. And, and truly, it is very important because companies do recognize it. But I think the question first start off with, with the technology companies developing uh, gaming software to be exported overseas. So I think that is really left to the jurisdiction of, of the uh, different countries, what they find acceptable or uh, to be controlled or not controlled. For example, I, I'm, I'm not that plugged into the actual regulations, but in China, for example, the limit 
they, they put you know, very strict rest uh, restrictions towards gambling. So gambling per se, it is prohibited. That's on, on one hand. In Hong Kong, for example, and, and um, as uh, uh, it was uh, discovered, the, the younger generation can be buying lottery tickets. Mm -hmm. They can be saying to their parents, it's my dream to win a jackpot, for example. Or they, they can go to a, a casino in Macau and it's a recreation weekend. So mm -hmm. some, in some cases, it's, it's widely acceptable and in some cases, it's not. So how different countries control the line to draw, it, it is very different. Great. Okay. Jasmine, did you have anything to add to this one? No, I don't. I think um, Bolivia, Vince, and Albert covered it. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, this brings us to the end of our Q&A period. We had a fantastic conversation and, and you all had given us lots to think about. Um, so please stick around for a few more moments. We just have a few more things to discuss before we move forward. So in terms of next steps, so what? You have this great research. You've heard from our community partners. So what's next? Well, the first thing I would say is we believe that it would be a great idea for you to continue to look at this report. This information was intended to support you and your organizations and may be helpful in the further development of your strategies and programs. It just kind of give you some things to think about. So again, we would want you to look at the report. We certainly will make that uh, available to everybody who's participated today. The second thing in terms of next steps would be reach out to us. We love hearing from our community partners to gain feedback and share ideas. Um, and explore partnership opportunities. Um, and there will be a slide that will be coming forward uh, with contact info for us as well. One of the other things that we wanted to share, sorry, if we could go back to the, uh, the slide prior. Oh, back one slide. Thank you. Okay, so we also wanted to share with each of you that there currently is a call for proposals looking to support culturally appropriate problem gambling awareness uh, counseling um, through CAMH. So you may find that the data that was shared in this research could actually support some of you who might be interested in applying for these funds. Uh, it is a great opportunity and we hope that some of you would consider exploring that. So information or a link to that can be sent out as well. Um, in terms of next steps from a community outreach perspective, uh, there is a lot happening in the gaming industry over the next couple of months here for us. So casinos and gaming spaces are reopening. Um, you know, Albert had referred to sports betting earlier. It's now legalized. And of course, iGaming is launching this spring. And so for us here at RGC, it means that we need to continue working uh, to identify and address risks and to explore new approaches that are intentional and meaningful and you know, using some of uh, what we heard from the research today uh, in reaching uh, the communities that we support. So the recommendations from this research clearly point out to the importance of building relationships with community partners to gain a deepened understanding of gambling behaviors and experiences to design and deliver enhanced direct service community programs. So this is an area that RGC is very interested in, partnering and working with you our community agencies, as we know that you know where all the gaps are and how to create a greater impact. And we wanna be with you in those spaces and collaborate with you to better understand how to develop materials, programming and engagement approaches that are much more meaningful and impactful to the communities that we're serving. So the research today for us will definitely inform how we continue to develop our approaches and strategies throughout our organization. And we're hoping the same for you as well. Um, we certainly are looking forward to the shift back to in-person engagement and events, um, including facilitations, um, you know, doing info sessions for community groups, um, and of course, participating in community opportunities. So if any of you have any opportunities or feel that this is something that RGC should be, you know, interested or, or looking at, again, definitely reach out to us. All of that to say, of course, that 2020 is going to be a very big year, I think, for everybody in the gaming industry. Um, and there's so much work to do. And we definitely look forward to working with each of you, too, to get this work done. So in closing, I just want to say once again, we uh, really want to highlight our amazing community panelists. Thank you all again for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. We appreciate your support and the input that you brought to this project in our session today. This slide here um, does provide you with the contact info for each of our panelists. So if you'd like to contact them directly, you're more than able to do so. And before you go, 
please fill out our evaluation. So there will be a QR code um, at the end of this webinar. A link will be sent to you later today and will be open for one week. We'd love to hear your feedback about the webinar and the information. Um, and this of course will help us plan and develop future webinars um, to come soon. Also, please sign up for our mailing list so you don't miss out on the next webinar or any additional gaming information that would be relevant for you. And lastly, a recorded version of this session will be available on our website. Again, we can find, be found at www.responsiblegambling.org. I also wanted to give a special shout out to Sasha, Alex, uh, Isabel, and everybody and our research team here at RGC. You guys did a fantastic job. The research was amazing. Um, and lastly, again, to all of you, the participants who joined us today, you helped us have a great success this afternoon. We look forward to connecting with all of you again in the future, whether it's to work together, whether it's to share information, uh, please drop us a line, uh, reach out and say hello. So once again, everybody have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us at our webinar and we hope to see you all soon. Take care.